Memento Mori. The story goes that in ancient Rome, whenever a general would return from battle uh, successfully, having triumphed over his enemies and uh, gone through a conquest of uh, massive proportions, they would throw a parade for him and his army, but you know, something really unusual that they did, um, which as far as I know they don't do today, which is that as the general was standing there on his chariot looking at all of the, um, the festivities and, and soaking in all of the praise and honor that comes from being a, a victorious general, there would be um, right beside him on the chariot a special person, uh, a slave actually, who was appointed there to stand there beside him and that slave had only one job. All he had to do was to continually repeat in the general's ears that phrase. Memento mori. Now, what does memento mori mean? Well, you might be able to guess what it means. Uh, memento is a word that we've carried over into English, and it has to do with you know, memory, remembering things. And mori, it, it comes from the uh, same root word where we get um, the word post-mortem, uh, which means, you know, after death. And the phrase memento mori means, remember, you are mortal. Uh, another word we get from that, mori base. Remember you're mortal. Uh, why would there be a slave appointed whose sole job is just to whisper in the ears of this victorious general, remember, you are mortal? And, you know, it doesn't actually take that much thought to realize what it was about. Um, that slave was there and those words were there to remind the general that even though at that instant in time, uh, you know, especially with the way that the uh, Roman religions and um, pantheon worked, you know, there was kind of this continuity with um, divinity and humanity that, you know, people uh, could be considered as gods. They were half gods and all that kind of thing. In that moment where all of this honor and praise and uh, glory was being laid upon this general, uh, where it looked, it would be tempting to believe that um, if, a, if anyone, at any moment, were a god, this would be it. The slave was there to remind that general, no, no, remember, you're not a god, you're mortal. Even though this moment is glorious and amazing, and you are powerful, having, you know, won this war, um, you are still a human being, just like the rest of us, and death will come for you, just like it comes for everyone else, including those enemies you've just vanquished. Now, this really interests me, that um, a culture, an ancient culture, even a culture whose um, capital city they called the Eternal City, even though it very much was not, even a culture like that recognized that it was important to reckon with the reality of death. Uh, and this, this is interesting to me because it seems like the very opposite of what modern culture does today. Um, it's a sort of contemporary thing to not just not think about death, but to actively avoid uh, even even considering or looking at it. So, you know, for instance, our whole, um, uh, you know, cosmetic surgery and uh, all these creams and hair dyes and all that kind of thing um, seems to be part of our collective desire to not want to look old and to put away the reality that death is coming for all of us, that we age and then we die. It's not something that we like to think about. And I suppose it's understandable why you wouldn't want to think about it. But um, today, I had the opportunity, um, the privilege really, to attend a funeral. I didn't know the man who had passed away, but I, um, I'm very good friends with his wife. And a funeral is a really interesting sort of thing. Obviously, it's very sad. Um, there's a lot of raw emotion flying around. But uh, it's also a really important time to stop and consider and think and reflect on things like mortality. Um, despite you know, not being really that old, I've been to, uh, I feel like, my fair share of funerals. And even though there's kind of, you know, it's this big gathering of people and in some ways, like a wedding, it's a gathering of people um, who are all all are connected to this one person and so the all of the people who gather are not necessarily all that well connected maybe they haven't seen each other for a long time and so it's kind of tempting to say oh look there's all these people who I haven't seen for ages I want to talk to them uh, and see how they've been and catch up but for me uh, and maybe because I've had some um, 
my early experiences with funerals were very personal. They weren't just, you know, for someone out there. Um, when I was 18, I went to my mother's funeral and was an integral part of that. I've always fi- found funerals a really important time just to stop and, um, and not necessarily chat or talk away, but to remember and reflect on the fact that um, death is real, that death is coming for all of us. Um, and one of the things which I, I reflected on today is that even though we like to think otherwise, um, and we use all kinds of language to say it, for instance, you know, uh, instead of a funeral being about uh, you know, necessarily grieving, it's about celebrating a life that was. And that's true, that's important, that's really valid. Um, and it's, I think it's uh, really valuable actually to consider a funeral um, partly as a positive thing. Um, I, I know what it's like when, you know, a funeral is as much um, mourning the end as well as sort of a sigh of relief. Um, in our age, you know, death can come slowly for people, uh, and that's part of the fact that we have really good healthcare. And so, people who might have died suddenly or very quickly in um, previous ages now take much longer to die. And I know that sounds really negative, but um, uh, it's a reality that actually, you know, that suffering drawn out can be a really awful thing to not just go through, um, but to watch a loved one go through. So, you know, it can be very much a sigh of relief to say, yes, this suffering which has been intense for so long, and for so many months or even years, um, is finally over. So, it's important to recognize those positive aspects. But at the same time, I feel like we miss something when we don't simply uh, allow ourselves to admit that death is wrong. Death is a tragedy. It's, it's not supposed to be this way. I used to think, uh, being that I lost my mother when I was relatively young, at least in modern terms, I used to think it's kind of a tragedy when you lose your parents, or you lose anyone, sorry, not just your parents, um, when you lose anyone before their time. So um, if they're very young, perhaps if they die from an accident, or um, they get struck by some kind of illness which is unusual as opposed to old age. But then I realized, um, the longer I, I interacted with people and saw saw people I knew, friends, colleagues, relatives, go through um, experience the death of loved ones, where those loved ones, for all intents and purposes, uh, lived what you might call a, a full life. Even when those people were very old, death was just as much a tragedy. Uh, in some ways, I, I don't know how to word this properly, but... Uh, for those people who I know who lost their parents is the most common one, parents in old age rather than when they were young, in some ways that loss is all the more bitter because that relationship has deepened over so much longer. Um, This probably sounds a bit awful, but because I lost my mother when I was young, I didn't get to know her as well as many people who who are my age now know their parents. Uh, I, I was a pretty lousy son, I think, in that during my high school years, I suppose like many adolescents, I just didn't really want to have anything to do with my parents. Um, and I thought they didn't understand me and I didn't understand them. And so it just, we didn't really get along. And so losing my mother when I was in my first year of uni, didn't have the time for, um, I didn't make myself uh, grow up and actually appreciate my parents, which often happens, funnily enough, when we ourselves become parents. I don't think that's a coincidence. But what this taught me was that, uh, yes, losing your parents at a young age is tragic. But losing your parents when they're old is also tragic. It doesn't make it better. It's, it's, it's very, very little comfort that you can say, oh, woohoo, I had an extra um, 30, 40, 50 years with them. Death itself, the end of life, is, um, is wrong. It's not meant to be like that. As I was sitting there in the chapel waiting for the funeral to begin, uh, as you can probably imagine, it brought back a whole flood of memories from uh, when I was younger and when my mother passed away, it was really, uh, I'm not a really sort of angry sort of person, but I was very frustrated and disappointed in my friends because, uh, not all of them, but some of them, uh, and not just friends, but relatives, in fact, a whole range of people who I'd expected to be more understanding or at least be more caring and they weren't. And that's not to say that people weren't understanding, weren't caring. Um, A vast majority of people were. And yet there were a few experiences that stuck in my mind uh, which really hurt me. Um, For instance, there was one friend who, uh, at university, I 
missed uh, weeks of university. I just, just couldn't go back. I applied for exemptions from assessments and exams and all that kind of thing. And after many weeks, I returned and uh, I sort of expected people to say, oh, you know, what happened? Uh, or, or what was the matter? Or, or I'm sorry, you know, I heard of your loss, that kind of thing. And there was one friend of mine who was in, um, in my computing course. And when he said hello to me, the first time I saw him again, it was like nothing had ever happened. And uh, when he didn't say anything, he didn't make any sort of um, advance to say, because I actually did know for a fact that others of my friends had told him what had happened in my life. Um, rather than saying, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, or, uh, you know, that must be really terrible for you, he almost acted as if it was no big deal, and just moved on with it, and just started talking about um, our assignments that we had to do, had to do, that we had to work on, and I was really hurt by that, I, I couldn't understand why someone would be so, I viewed it at the time, as really insensitive, and callous, and unfeeling, and just uh, totally unsympathetic. Uh, and I was frustrated by that a lot. Uh, I also had well-meaning friends who um, would talk to me and say, and try and encourage me, basically. And they would say, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, she's in a better place now, my mother. Um, or things like, you know, she'd be so proud of you and what you've achieved. Or, um, you know, the hard things in life are always um, preparing you for... Um, they're making your character better. All these kinds of trying to see the positive side of things, basically. And um, in the same way, I found those kinds of words and people trying to encourage me as also really hurtful. Because the thing was that I knew all of these things that people were telling me. Um, and they were often encouraging me to, you know, say, you know, don't, don't feel so bad. Um, try to, you know, keep your chin up, keep going. Don't be depressed about it. And... Even though I knew all of the things that they were telling me, the emotional reality just wasn't there. And I, I couldn't make myself feel better. Uh, and I didn't need someone to tell me to make myself feel better because I couldn't do it. So I thought to myself, um, over the last, it's been, uh, it's been nine years now, um, over the last nine years, what have I learned? Um, well, I think one of the things I realized was that I expected too much of my friends. Um, now, you know, if you're an 18 year old, you probably, I hope, haven't had to deal that much with death in your life. And so I now uh, have come to see and uh, apologize for the fact that I didn't understand this before. That most of my friends who seemed, you know, insensitive or calloused or unsympathetic, uh, they weren't, they weren't that. It's just that they didn't know what to say. Um, they hadn't dealt with it. They, they didn't understand the situation and they knew they didn't understand it. Uh, and they knew that nothing they could say could make things better. And so they resorted to what they knew, which was just to try and get on with life as best as they could. And so I, um, I didn't realize that about my friends. I expected too much of them. Um, and so one of the things I want to encourage um, you now, if you're younger and you just haven't uh, encountered death that much in your life, um, and perhaps you know people you know are grieving or mourning, Here's a helpful kind of um, picture that I've, I've heard, which helps me um, now, even, even today, being much older and having learned a lot more lessons, to, um, to grieve well, if that makes sense, um, and to help others to grieve well. So uh, what I want you to picture is um, the person who you feel is most at the center of this grief. So maybe that's a husband or a wife or, or a, a father or a son or daughter or whoever it is. Um, and literally get a piece of paper and, and write their name in the middle of the piece of paper. Uh, all the people who you feel are closest to this tragedy. Then draw, draw a circle around them. After that circle, on the outside of the circle, um, write down the names of people who you know who are close to the situation but not as close to the situation as the people who you've already written down. So maybe instead of the immediate family, it might be um, uncles and aunties or grandchildren or and uh, let's see you know work colleagues and, and so on R write them down and then after you've gathered together those people draw another circle and then on the outside of that circle write down people you know who are disconnected even more so for instance people who might have known that person met him her uh, worked with them or, or, or um, you know just had dinner with them once or something like that um, people who are, are further away from the situation but would still feel that grief, okay? 
Um, and then you can draw another circle and you can keep on going as, as far as you like. Um, and then also, finally, um, try and work out where you fit in, um, in those concentric circles. So you may well be, you know, sort of right on the very edge or somewhere in the middle or something like that. Um, put your name in it as well, or maybe just put a star for where you belong. Okay. Now, um, here's, here's what helps me um, in, in talking to people who are going through grief. Um, if you are talking to someone who is closer to the center than you are, okay, um, closer to the center, um, more connected to the, the tragedy or the grief, then you have one job, uh, and only one, and that is support. All you have to do is support. Um, you have to be there for those people. You don't necessarily have to say all that much. Your physical presence means a lot. Um, you just you can offer things to them. You can try to um, think of practical ways that might help them, like cooking a meal, all those kinds of things. That's all you do to the people who are who are closer into the center. Support. That's all you do. Now maybe you feel very grieved by this situation yourself. Maybe you feel like you know this person. They were great friends, something like that. But your burdens are not meant to go to people on the inside. Um, those people are feeling more of a burden and more grief than you. If you have burdens and grief and troubles, which you ought to have, you should push those to people outside. Um, you should say to people who know them, know the person less well than you, you know, I'm just finding this really hard. I'm exhausted and I, I don't even know how to um, cope at work now that this person is gone or etc. All of those um, griefs and burdens and difficulties, they have a place. But that place is not going back onto the people who are closer into the situation. They should be going to people further out. Um, and stories, you know, for you, you know, uh, one of the most common sorts of reactions to stories of difficulty and trial is we think of our own difficulty and trial. Um, and so, you know, if you have, if you want to make comparisons to your own situation, you don't do that to the people inside you know closer to the um, center of the circle because they're just feeling the grief and um, struggling to come to, to terms with it themselves let alone dealing with you know you and your own problems um, which are something altogether different so if you want to talk about those talk to people outside further out of, from the circle um, and that'll be a way that you make sure you don't say things that are inappropriate or unhelpful to people and if you feel like you know uh, I'm always on the outside, you know, I'm never actually in the inside and I've, I've, I'm, I'm always um, supporting all these other people and pushing out um, uh, my difficulties and griefs to people who are further out, you know, don't worry, if there's one thing that's certain in life, it's that you're going to have your turn in the center of the circle, okay? So I've found that kind of mental framework really helpful in thinking about, okay, how do I talk to people who are grieving? Uh, it's a really helpful guide. And one other thought that I had. Uh, while I was sitting there listening actually to um, the eulogies and the people talking about their memories of the person who passed away is that recognizing death um, and reckoning with its reality being willing to admit that it's a tragedy it's just wrong recognizing death ought to make us value life it ought to make us think carefully about what matters in life what we want to be remembered for what we want to remember when we're on our um, on our deathbed or what we want people to say about us at our eulogy and this is interesting to me because just recently I went to my 10 year high school reunion which is a really um, nice time about uh, let's see a quarter of my grade got back together which was nice after 10 years considering a lot of people are interstate and overseas and after 10 years 10 years is kind of enough time for people to have finished studying mostly sorry med people um, finished studying and uh, actually done something with their lives, gone places, um, done something interesting, all those kinds of things. And being there, uh, you know, seeing all these people, talk, catching up, talking about all the kinds of things that we'd done was really interesting and I really enjoyed it at the time. But now, after, after attending this funeral today, I now am just posing the question to myself of how much of what my friends 10 years on after high school and, and, and what we've done, how much of it will we remember or will be worth remembering on our deathbeds? Um, what will be uh, worth saying, yes, this is something that's um, uh, valuable and that I achieved and that I did for others and that others will remember? Um, will all of the traveling and all of the career climbing and all of that kind of thing, will that really be um, valuable to us? when 
death comes knocking on our door. Now, maybe the answer to that is yes, I don't know. I suppose it differs for every individual. But I think the important thing is to actually ask that question. I think too many people go through life never considering, is this gonna be something that's worthwhile in the long run? We just do things because the opportunity's there, because we're following what everyone else is doing in, in our culture, and um, we're not actually questioning whether it's gonna be something which uh, we want to remember and which we want to be remembered for. There's some thoughts. I don't know how true they are. Take them for what you will, but I don't know. For my two cents, I think the ancient Romans are onto something with memento mori.